Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Santos, Executive Director of the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings, and in partnership with the Department of Fine Arts, Arete, Music Arts Incorporated, and the Philippine Theater Actor Guild, we would like to welcome everyone in this panel discussion titled Women in STEM, Being and Writing About Women in the Sciences with a playwright of Half-Life of Marie Curie, I don't know if I pronounce it. My French is not as good as others. Um, we have Lauren, the wonderful Lauren Gunderson, who is joining us via Zoom. And then we also have wonderful, um, notable scientists on our campus, Dr. Olivia Benefe, who's now the chairwoman of the Department of Chemistry. And Professor Kathy Vistrayu, the current program coordinator for mathematics education from the Department of Mathematics, and of course, a board member of the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings. We are here today inspired and empowered by the glowing friendship that radiated between Hertha Ayrton and Marie Curie in Lawrence play The Half-Life of Marie Curie, which is currently running in Areta, and I think they still have, if you haven't seen the play, they still have a couple of shows this weekend. So please visit no, um, the Facebook pages of um, Fine Arts and um, I think Music Arts. No? But, it was fascinating to see the convergence of the sciences and the humanities through this play as it showcases the human dimensions behind the logics of science. Some technical. Some Hello, my test. My test, could you hear us, Lauren? Just a moment. Could you hear? Okay, Lauren. Brilliant. So, going back, um, it was fascinating to see the convergence of the sciences and the humanities through display as it showcases the human dimensions behind logics of science. Like the radiance of Marie Curie's discovery, some of us who have seen the play were in awe of the achievements of these women. At the same time, like the rippling waves of air and light discovered by Hertha Ayrton, their struggles and joys moved our hearts. Through this play, we witness the struggles of women in the 19th century as they find their place in science. And at the same time, it has piqued our interest in finding women's place in the sciences. For this afternoon, we're hoping to have a dialogue with our speakers in hopes of mapping the intersections between the humanities, womanhood, and the sciences. And I think on that note, there's no better woman who could be you know, at the forefront of this intersection than the woman who played Marie Curie herself. No? Um, it would be Dr. Missy Maramara from the Fine Arts Department and also a board member of the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings. Let's give her a round of applause for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Welcome to Ateneo Lauren. And welcome, students. Thank you so much for um, joining us because without you, this would all be pointless, right? Mm -hmm. The whole idea of this project is to really engage students in the humanities and in the sciences to see how this play brings out the relevance of both both levels no, in the academe and how each one is very important in the development of the human person which Ateneo is all about right um, and we hope that what you learn from our esteemed speakers and playwright deepen your appreciation for everything you're studying in this university and that you take it out into the world as bastions of light as men and women as persons for others thank you so much for being here thank you panel thank you Lauren
and thank you, Ms. Grayson. Thank you. So on that note, I'd like to introduce our speakers this afternoon. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce the playwright of um, The Half-Life of Marie Curie, Ms. Lauren Gunderson. She's a playwright, screenwriter, and short story author from Atlanta, Georgia. She received her BA in English and Creative Writing at Emory University and her MFA in Dramatic Writing in NYU Tisch. She's been one of the most produced playwrights in America since 2015, topping the list thrice no? um, in two, 2022 and 2023. No? Um, she's a well-awarded um, playwright, um, two-time winner of the Steinberg New Play Award for INU and the Book of Will, the winner of the William Inge Distinguished Achievement in Theater Award, the Lanford Wilson Award, and the Otis Currency New Voices Award, a finalist for the Susan Blacksmith, uh, Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, there you go, Weisberger Award, and John Gassner Award for Playwriting, and of course the recipient of the Mellon Foundation's residency with Marin Theater Company. She's also, more than a playwright, she's also written blog, uh, books published by Bloomsbury, Play Scripts, Dramatist Play Service, and she has a picture book called Dr. Wonderful, Blast Off to the Moon that is available online via Amazon. She's the book writer of musicals as well, from Jeanette, The Time Traveler's Wife, Sinister, Justice and Earthrise, and Built for This. And lastly, she's also the board member of the Playwrights Foundation. We'd like to welcome Ms. Lauren Gunderson. And now for the first of our scientists from Ateneo de Manila University, Dr. Olivia Erin M. Buenafe, or to Dr. We, not I kept on saying Dr. Uwe, and I was like Dr. V, no? um, is an assistant professor and currently the chair of the Department of Chemistry of Ateneo de Manila University. An ADMU alumna, Dr. Benefe earned her BS and MS degrees in chemistry in 2004 and 2006, respectively, and is a registered chemist. She studied her PhD on biomedical sciences in KU Leuven in Belgium, working with zebrafish as an epilepsy and seizure model for drug discovery and development. And at the same time, She's also married, happily married, to Mr. Jos Joseph B. Johnson from the Theology Department, and they have met, dated, and wed each other while they were graduate students in Leuven before returning here in the Philippines in 2014. Our second um, scientist for this afternoon is Dr. Catherine Vistroyu, or Dr. Kathy, um, the professor from the Department of Mathematics, um, and she obtained her bachelor's degree here in Ateneo, not so long ago, um, and earned her master's degree in mathematics education from the University of Georgia, you know, close to where, um, I'm not sure if it's the same, if the University of Georgia is also found in Atlanta, um, but it's the same state at least, um, also not too long ago. No? Um, she's currently the program coordinator for mathematics education in the Department of Math here in Ateneo, um, and she currently teaches, you might have encountered her in classes concerning mathematics in the modern world, pre-calculus, and other calculus courses. Her research interests include curriculum, ethnomathematics, social cultural aspect of mathematics teaching and learning, and critical mathematics education, which includes social justice in mathematics education. She has served as member of the National Board of the Philippine Council of Mathematics and is also involved with the International Commission on Mathematical Instruction. Um, she currently serves as a um, member of the International Program Committee for ICMI Study 27 on the theme Mathematics Education and the Social Ecological. Um, and is the chair of the local organizing committee for the study conference happening in January 2025 here in Ateneo de Manila University, something we can look forward to um, in terms of the mathematics. She has also received prestigious awards such as the Outstanding Women in the Nation Service in 2007, Metrobath Foundation's Outstanding Teacher for Tertiary Level in 2012, and just this year, Metrobank Foundation's Award for Continuing Excellence in Service. Beyond the sciences, she is also happily married, sana all. Um, one day, one day, I'll get there. Um, 
to, to Dr. Darwin Yu, who's her husband, who's also a retired faculty and former dean of JG Som, um, for almost 33 years and counting, with whom she has two daughters. I heard one of them is into mathematics as well, um, Becca and Sarah. So on that note, let's welcome Doc Wee and Doc Kathy this afternoon. So for our discussion today, how many of you have seen um, the play at Race of Hands? For those of you who have seen the play, there's a handful. I hope some of you would get to catch. Oh, yeah, some of them are booked for Saturday. So I hope some of you get to watch the show. No, um, and well, for those of you who don't know, the 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 play is about the relationship or the friendship, no, of um, Dr. Marie Curie um, and also Dr. Uh, was she a doctor? Or was more of like a Mrs. at that point in the play, Mrs. Um, Hertha Ayrton, no? who was an um, engineer and mathematician. No? And it's their booming friendship and how they supported each other throughout the years. And I think it's quite unusual for us to see scientists at the heart of a play um, until quite recently. I mean, we're seeing now television shows and now we have this play. And I think for Lauren, I want to ask, what was your inspiration to write the Half-Life of Marie Curie. Was it, uh, um, did you see the gossip around uh, Marie Curie's life and that's where it started? Wait. Um, excuse me, Lauren, there's a bit of a technical matter. Yeah, but, yeah. We're just a little technical matter. The, the audio is not coming out. Can you do a short mic, mic, mic test? Mic sure. That work now? Okay. <laughs> Um, yes, great. So I, um, uh, I've read a lot about science. One of my very earliest plays and throughout my career has been a lot of stories of scientists. And uh, while I started writing um, about the most famous scientists I knew, I certainly realized that they were all men. And so quickly pivoted to say, what are the untold stories, which are largely um, uh, women's stories uh, in the sci sciences and the history of science. So I've written about um, uh, American scientist and astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt, about Emily Marquis de Chatelet, who was a mathematician and um, partner of Voltaire's uh, physicist before there was a word for physicists, um, uh, Ada Lovelace and her computer early computer engineering with Charles Babbage. And you know, so I, I say all of those because none of those are the most famous women scientists in the world, which is Marie Curie. <laughs> so everyone kind of said, "When are you going to write a Marie Curie play?" play? And I said, "Well, it's too obvious. It's just too obvious." Um, and then I heard about Hertha, and Hertha was interesting enough on her own, enough to fill many plays. But what was most interesting to me was a line where she said, it said something about her best friend Marie Curie. Um, you know, she, she helped her best friend Marie Curie through one of the hardest times of her life, and I thought, well, that's the play. <laughs> so it is not just enough to be about Marie, um, even though she gets the title because you know her name, um, but it is truly about the duo of them, the, the dyad of very, women of um, the same intelligence, uh, but different levels of success and notoriety, um, and, y you know, also telling the part of Marie Curie's story that we don't know. We know her as looking at that very school marmish, very conservative, high black neck and severe expression and not a love story or a sex scandal or <laughs> somebody that you would imagine having too much whiskey and talking to her best friend. And that to me is the heart of what theater is best at, is give, giving us humanity um, and through the microscope um, of an intimate theater experience. So it felt writable and one of my plays I'm, I'm most proud of. Right, I, re I do remember the scene where they were lying down on the beach with their feet up, <laughs> drunk on science and joy that afternoon. Now for um, Doc Uwe and Kathy, what were your inspirations to venture into the sciences? Okay. 
this is this is quite interesting. Uh, my first uh, inspiration to go into the sciences was actually through literature. I was a, a I was basically a bookworm all throughout uh, the early part of my life. So. Uh, Okay, subsisting first on classical Victorian children's literature, and then I stumbled into uh, very, it's, it's, it's very corny, it's, it's the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, and then I discovered that, hey, he's actually a chemist. He actually, he, he may be a detective, but the way he, he analyzed a problem, how he, he looked into the clues, it's actually chemistry, so that's where I first got into that particular field. And then I read about uh, Pierre and Marie Curie, and then it, it, it just snowballed from there. And then it's pretty much the influence of getting into the into Philippine science for my high school, and then meeting uh, luminaries in the field, uh, including my, uh, she then became my biochemistry professor here in Ateneo, uh, Dr. Nina Rojas, who was very formative and my passion and love for the field. That's pretty much it, and it goes on, and I hope that it, I, I could actually serve as a guidepost for other students, and now former students, graduates, who are in the field. For, <clears throat> for me, it is my dad. Um, he was the one who thought that all his children should be good in math. And because I was also a daddy's girl, uh, in many ways, I, uh, I wanted to please him. The thing was, I discovered I was good in math. And so that further solidified my interest in, in the subject. Um, later, um, in high school, I joined the junior summer seminar here in Ateneo. And one of my teachers was Charles Kua, who was another male teacher, <laughs> was very good in math and just became my idol. And I said, I want to be like him. But uh, it turned out that um, as a mathematician, I thought maybe I'm more in service if I teach. <laughs> so I went into teaching, and um, my inspiration there, of course, were my math teachers. In so it's a, it's a shift from math to math education, but I still consider myself a mathematician. Right, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's, I mean, you do mention how there were male inspirations, no? but there were also, you know, a handful of women no? um, in the field. Now, I mean, one thing interesting about the play is that for, you know, there's something intersectional about it especially in terms of the lives of the academics and the sciences. Um, in many ways, it celebrates their lives as scientists, which is deeply also intertwined no, with their lives as women. Like, you almost, like, I remember, um, what do you call this, Marie, um, we're feeling close, Marie uh, was lamenting about um, attending the Nobel Peace Prize, right? And yet there's that scandal hanging over her head um, with regards to it. And um, I think for Lauren, um, I know you were inspired by their story and their friendship, but how did you find um, this balance in capturing their lives as women in science and scientists as you wrote this play? Because I think that was a wonderful aspect of the play wherein they would talk about their sciences like um, earlier um, they'll talk about the radium and then they'll talk about the waves and so on. Yeah, you know that's the thing about um, writing uh, characters who are very very smart is you have to both allow for the audience to have a bridge into the subject so they feel like they can learn something, um, that it is the barrier isn't so high to be in the room with Marie Curie that you wouldn't bother showing up because she's going to talk about things that are way over your head. But also you want to have Marie speak like Marie would. And so my version is somewhere in between of being able to express, sometimes through metaphor, um, as opposed to here's the lecture version, the PowerPoint version of what Marie Curie means. It's through uh, one of her first monologues is the, the, the kind of warmth and radiation uh, um, 
is a, a kind of non-subtle metaphor for love <laughs> and passion. Um, and so using that as kind of a way to get used to the language uh, in a more approachable subject than just diving into the physics. Um, but the truth is that, you know, so much of the play is the, the metaphor, um, you could use any metaphor. It could, it, it could be about dentistry, it could be about, you know, <laughs> um, forestry, it could be about biology. If, you were to change out Marie with another another scientist or another expert in something, because the truth of any good play, no matter what it's about, is it's about the heart, it's about the people, and it's about the, the relationships and change of it. So because the play is set in private spaces, we're not watching, except for a few little moments um, that are in public, these women are allowed to be who they need to be in that moment. And sometimes that is raging, and sometimes it is weeping, and sometimes it is very technical and competitive or, um, uh, you know, expository uh, about their great work, and that's kind of the joy of it, is figuring out how they can be human, um, how they can be women, and then how they can be the brilliant uh, scientists that they are. Right. I mean, I mean that's true, because a lot of the scenes feature them, you know, in, in um, first, I think, in Marie's um, lab, no, not laboratory, but in her room, and then later on in air desification home, and I think whether, like in in um, the case of our lovely scientists, um, it showcases their roles as women and scientists, and somehow, um, at that time, it seems like the science and their femininity run counter with each other, um, and yet we can see here that the connection. And, um, between them also enrich their lives. I guess I'd like to ask, um, were there scenes in the play that resonated with you that made you reflect on you know, the way science has enriched your life or the way your womanhood has enriched your science? Yeah. Oh, Doc, get started. <laughs> there was a scene where they talked about proofs. And, and I thought, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren, for that. Uh, <laughs> because as a math educator, one of our lamentations is our students have a hard time learning how to prove yeah. and in math. And I can understand because my life story is when I was a, a beginning geometry student in high school, I could not do proofs right away. I remember crying my eyes out because I could not do the homework. But then something clicked after my sister helped me. And from then on, I was like unstoppable. I could just prove. And, and I was like called the geometry queen because of that uh, in my school. But um, science, in this case, mathematics has enriched me as a woman because mathematics has taught me how to be more logical, more yeah. rational in my approaches. Um, and I think one of the beauties of mathematics is that it really helps you develop this tension to speak the truth, the truth, the objective truth. And, and I think that's what uh, that's all of us you know, should be doing that. So in that sense, you know, and I find myself saying also as a woman, I want to think like a man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is which is bad. <laughs> because it seems like uh, the man is men are the ones who can think better than women. But but it's just like that. Um, I think society has already placed that expectation that men think better than women. And so there. <laughs> Me. Well, for me, the, the most significant, just like with an, I just like with Doc Patty, the most memorable part for me is how uh, Marie just said, we love our lovers, we adore our children, but our life's passion is proof. And I loved it in so many different levels, especially that she was drinking whiskey at that time. <laughs> Maybe proof <laughs> young, okay? <laughs> but uh, on, a, on a personal level, it, it, it just resonated, especially that, okay, um, being a chemist and, and someone who's actually at the intersection of, of biomedical sciences and chemistry, being in the drug discovery program, uh, I, I remember sometimes how my husband would say, 
I've never seen you in your happiest unless you're actually talking about your work. It's you you do have your sparkle when you when you're with me or when you're when you're interacting with our with our with our little sprout with, with Anne. But you look at your best. You're actually you actually shine when you're actually talking about your work and in a sense there's a, a, a tinge of 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 loneliness in my part because it's like I only find myself at my say at my fullest when I'm actually talking about my work which is uh, not just teaching science but actually doing science and it's something that uh, I have to say sometimes my daughter would say she kind of wants a mama who is a mama and not a mama who actually is a scientist who's actually at her best and brightest when in the lab. <laughs> that's the thing. I love I, I love my family, don't worry about it. But that's pretty much it. What 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 Marie Curie just said that when I when I saw it uh, when I watched it delivered, it just hit me and it and I, I, I was with my husband at that time. I just looked at him and it also struck him and said, Yeah, I see the truth of it. I really see the truth of it. That's that's really nice and to hear and well you mentioned also that you have daughters and so on do they also in a way join you in your ventures for example like if you do your lectures in relation to your research or if you're if you're doing lab work does your daughter join you <laughs> for safety reasons no but <laughs> but especially for 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 the for the university community here, she has been with uh, with me and my husband here in campus since she was three months old. She pretty much grew up in this academic community, and she has seen us in our professional uh, mode, teaching, or in, in in some cases wherein I have to tend to my zebrafish lab, wherein I actually actively work there and uh, take care of uh, of research business so i don't know if she's going to follow my footsteps or my husband's footsteps in the humanities she might end up in fine arts i don't know <laughs> <laughs> she might be inspired to write as well about scientists someday we'll never know how about you kathy your daughter yes my eldest daughter is also a bs math major here in the wow Ohio. And uh, she and I, we understand each other when we talk about math and we laugh at the same jokes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's now a science communicator in Marine Science Institute in UP. So she, in, in a way, she's following a path uh, related to science. And they grew up also here in the, in the Ateneo. <laughs> and um, it reached the point where I knew that they picked up a lot on my work because when I gave a seminar to teachers in a conference and I asked them, can you assist me? And they said, sure, no problem. And they were like, they were like veterans, you know, wow. showing, showing the teachers what to do and demonstrate they actually understand your work. Yeah. They're now adults and <laughs> you, you still have a growing daughter. so. <laughs> Oh, that's right. My second daughter was her student <laughs> in chemistry, and also uh, John. Yeah, and also in theology. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. It's like a family affair, you know. But but I think it also shows how I think exposure to the sciences also inspires us, and that um, it. And in many ways, this is how our lives as women, as mothers, as educators, also influence not their, or kind of like trigger and inspire um, their interests in the sciences. Now, um, a good part of um, the play involves challenges no, um, between Marie and Hertha throughout their career. Um, a particularly move, moving moment for me, you know, as uh, someone who saw the play, was the scene where um, Marie was asked not to attend the Nobel Peace Prize. This is like her second you know, Nobel Peace Prize, and her not being allowed to become a part of um, the Royal Society. Now, this was, of course, um, a gendered problem back in the 19th century, and 
perhaps for Lauren, were there any challenges on your part in trying to capture the hardships of Marie and Hertha? Like any stumbling blocks at particular scenes um, where there's something that you wanted to capture, but you know, you weren't quite sure on how to write it down in paper. why I come to tell so many stories about women in science is because what makes it so hard for them historically makes great theater. What you need is a main character who has a struggle that's, that is almost impossible to overcome. That's why we're watching it, because we know that the story is going to tell us if they do uh, overcome it or if, um, if society won't let them or if some other opposing force. So. It is, uh, those are the things that make the play worth writing, are those moments of great struggle. Um, I think of theater as a thought experiment that we get to go on as an audience member, um, or as audience members, and part of the reason why we want to know the answer to this particular experiment is because some version of it will happen to us. Some version will, will come up against something that we, we don't know if we can, we, we don't know if we can um, climb that mountain, or we will come up against suffering or grief or triumph or love. We will have questions we don't know how, who to turn to in a situation and the play helps answer um, by asking uh, in, in a spe the specifics um, of that one person, of the, of the main character's um, circumstance. So the circumstance of these two main characters is, yeah, the world didn't want them to succeed and they did anyway, and to, to, various, to various degrees. And then even when they did succeed, it was, a, it was this, you know, just tawdry affair that was going to threaten the reputation of the most beloved and celebrated woman on earth at the time. Um, and, you know, not the man, his, it, was, it was her who, he, she was getting the, the brunt of the things. He was just sort of lightly congratulated, you know, but like, tsk, tsk, but like, nice job, dude. And she was taken off her pedestal and threatened to not be given the award that she deserved, and among many, many other things. So it, it's that's to me the reason to write the entire play is um, is that stuff. So there was no stumbling box. It was more finding. It's it's a bit it's a bit um, psychotic to be a playwright because everyone else's misfortune <laughs> is my great treasure. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad the terrible thing happened to Marie Curie. I can't wait to write about it. <laughs> Excuse my glee at everyone's um, <laughs> misfortune. <laughs> No, that's that's all right. It does make you know an interesting story. Oh, thank you. Um, it does make an interesting story, and I think for um, Doc Kathy and Doc Wee, were there scenes in the plays where you also reflected on some of the challenges that you face as a mathem mathematics educator and chemist? Do you also resonate with some of these prejudices that they encountered? Um, or, for example, the lack of access. Like I remember, there's a part where um, Marie was crying over my laboratory. You know, she will lose her laboratory and so on. So, me. There's one thing that I remembered when the when uh, the discussion about the limitations, the impositions during that time uh, on women scientists. Uh, Thankfully, it's not as obvious or as blatant as it is now, but it can be very subtle. Uh, uh, it can be uh, it can be very subtle, especially in the biomedical sciences and in, in biochemistry. Wherein I do remember uh, in our research lab, but back when I was a graduate student, but back when I was doing my doctoral studies, we were mostly women. We only had like three men in our group. Uh, three graduate students who are men, um, but we are mostly women. And of different stages in life, single, uh, cohabiting with a partner or married, but we were instructed, and this was the general instruction for uh, for a lot of the women in, in that uh, research group, and as well as for the other research groups uh, in biomed uh, science uh, area. We were not supposed to get pregnant. We can have as many affairs as we'd like, if we'd like, but we're not supposed to get pregnant, we're not supposed to have children, because it would mean that it, it is time away from the lab, away from productivity, and it, it means a longer time in actually 
finishing our doctoral degrees. It was generally from that, which is something very much in contrast with uh, the friends that I made in in the philosophy faculty in Leuven, who were actually generally encouraged to say, go experience life, fall in love, get married, have children. It will improve your writing. It will improve your the way you think about life in general. While for us, especially in STEM and in the biomed area, we were pretty much banned from it. No mm -hmm. Kathy? Uh, I've been lucky. I have not really had a very bad experience with regards to being prejudiced or biased uh, because I was against, because I was, I'm a woman. Um, but I've seen how it has happened. And as a math educator, uh, one of the research areas actually that, that uh, is in math education is women, girls, and mathematics. How women and girls are denied uh, a good mathematics education for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, it, is, it is a problem because, of course, um, we cannot rely on men all the time, right? So, but uh, also, uh, it talks about social justice and equal access. And, but in general, in my field, in math education, um, we're pretty much well-placed as women. There are more women math educators in the, here in the Philippines, but you go. But then it's very subtle, as you said. You go up the career ladder, mm -hmm. and in many countries, the male dominates yeah. uh, the the field. So the, the international field. institutes usually it's yes. the men who would take the top position. But what's positions. interesting now is that in the field, in math education at least. We are trying, we are always aiming for gender balance. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a beneficiary of that. Like I was invited to be nominated for a position in the International Commission because I'm a woman and I come from a poor country, you know, so it's like they, they want a balance. So in that sense, um, you really have to be, I guess, a sharp. Mm -hmm. in identifying those instances where mm -hmm. there's a lot of prejudice happening. And I think to a certain extent, it, 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 it favors, I don't know if it's a proper word to say that favors us, but it, it actually opens um, conversation because they're inviting you know, um, women and also women from different countries to share their own experience of the sciences because for any field, not just the sciences, there are new ones experiences, there are new ones um, aspects to learning, to teaching, to even you know laboratories, etc. Um, by virtue of where we are in the world and who we are you know, as women, I think I think there was I to a certain extent I didn't think it would be uh, a challenge still because you know we're supposed to be living in a very liberal world where we you know we're acknowledged yeah that we're already coming gender aware but i think it's still there and there's still so much to do and so much to work and i think with these challenges um usually many as seen in the play can be overcome with support you know so part of the play i was explaining to lauren earlier um before the start of the talk was one of the funniest or it's a mix. There are mixed emotions because there are so many feels in that scene. But I was telling Lauren that you know it was funny to see, um, Ber uh, sorry, Hertha and Marie go through their the I guess the Gen Z term is their brat summer, um, and oh no, they're cringing, <laughs> cringe away. We're we're fully aware of these trends, but. Um, but yeah, you know, they were going through they were going through their own brat summer in in England, where they were basically just basking in, relaxing, unwinding, doing the things that are not expected of women for that summer, so that they can be themselves, etc. And it's part of how they supported each other because there were also very important conversations that were shared between them. So. Um, I think my question to Lauren is, why did you feel that this Brat Summer was so important for um, Hertha and Marie um, as part of your play? 
Yeah, I mean, it's the reason to, to write the play in general was because of this extraordinary act that was a true story where Hertha came to Marie's rescue and said, you know, I'm not just going to kind of come to you, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to excise you from the situation and the place uh, of such stress um, and abuse and bring you to this other place where no one knows who you are. She traveled under a pseudonym. And the idea of a friend that can do that kind of huge emotional labor to to someone's aid um, felt like more more than a friend, a savior, a, a, a heroine, um, and and someone that it, a singular kind of a friend. Um, and so that to me, the idea of the the brat of it is them um, having the uh, safety to be wild and be brazen and to have arguments that they would normally have edited out uh, um, and to have confessions and to do the strange things. Marie runs into the ocean um, to kind of baptize herself anew into, into a, new, a new sort of frame of mind to save her own self after Hertha had done the first part of it. Um, and that kind of comes with a wildness uh, that felt really wonderful, especially in contrast with, again, what we think of when we think of a f any female scientist, but certainly Marie Curie and those black and white pictures and her severity, and to have her throw her dress off and run into the ocean and, you know, admit how wonderful um, the love affair was and uh, to drink too much and confess how, you know, scheming she was at these parties, making people knowingly nervous, uh, just felt delightful. And again, sort of, I mean, part, part of my, my job as well is to kind of undercut a stereotype whenever I meet one. And certainly the stereotype of the straight nose scientist and very serious and cold and fact-based. And that, of course, the, the amazing women that are here on the panel and every other scientist have full lives and heartbreaks and joys and strange humor and all of the 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 stuff of humanity, you know, not just the brain. So wanting to, to allow them to be more than than just their work or their ideas. Right. And um and I think that and yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um thank you. and that was really, really um a very fun scene to watch, you no know? um and very and of of course very poignant especially as they impact um their relationship, not just with themselves, but also with their work and with their families. Now, I guess that was an interesting scene in terms of support, but here in the Philippines, do you also have um, organizations, women's only organization that support, for example, mathematics educators or for example, scientists here, chemists, or is that still? As far as I know, um, we don't have any women-only uh, chemistry societies. As far as I know, I'll be shocked for this. There is. There is? I'll, I'll show you later. <laughs> In the Philippines? Oh, oh. it's news for me. <laughs> but um, but we also have, uh, as, as is mentioned, we, we, we are human after all. We also have our own um, Circles of friends uh, who are also scientists, not not, not necessarily just in, in the specific field. I mean, my uh, my daughter's Nina, my daughter's uh, godmother, Mother. is actually a physicist in the semiconductor industry, wow. and she basically, when we were both graduate students in Europe, she basically played my Hertha to my Marie during that time <laughs> during my own drama, <laughs> and vice versa. So. Uh, we support each other despite seeing the pitfalls and the travails of doing science in this world. So um, we're not simply limited to trying to look for women, women only societies. We form our own societies of like-minded women in the same or similar fields. Okay. In the ICMI, uh, there is an affiliated international organization called the International Organization for Women in Mathematics Education. So it's really, but the membership is not limited to women. Mm -hmm. It's really for people who believe in uh, women as contributing to the development of mathematics and mathematics education. Um, here in the Philippines, I am a member of my professional organization um, 
composed of mathematics educators in the Philippines, but uh, most of us in the board uh, are women. But of course, it's not an all women. Yeah. I, I guess part of it is uh, we do get support from our own female groups, mm -hmm. not necessarily for our own careers. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm a member of Towns, I'm a member of, I support, uh, I see, I Can Serve Foundation being a cancer survivor, for mm -hmm. example. And so those things, uh, um, we women know to get together when they need to, I guess, mm -hmm. that's it. No? And there's there's a there's a special bond <coughs> that you feel, not necessarily for your work, but for mm -hmm. life in general. Yeah. yeah, and this is where the I guess the confluence of um, being a woman, yeah. you know, comes into play, you know, into your that, that to that dimension of your life, right? Um, <coughs> and, um, beyond these organizations, it is this support of women, both professionally and intimately. And actually, we're fortunate in hearing your stories that it's a lot more inclusive here in the Philippines, that there's room for support um, for women. It, we, there may not be a formal women's organization, but you know, women in the academics is more supportive here you now as opposed to um, maybe other countries, right? Um, and I guess to, um, to continue this question, um, I guess, what do you think is a way to make um, the sciences um, more accessible to women? Um, because that's part of the thing wherein um, you mentioned earlier that this seems to be, it's a good thing here in the Philippines, it's already accessible, but for areas or maybe for other parts of the world or other parts of the country where it's still inaccessible, how do we encourage um, more women to get um, inspired by you know, uh, the sciences? Inspired by that. Um, as a math education researcher, I've, I've really seen that um, one of the hindrances of uh, women getting into mathematics and sciences the culture that they're in, their family. Uh, usually, I've heard of many, many, many stories of parents not even believing that their daughters can thrive in a science career or in a math mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. And that right away, uh, you know, uh, closes the door to, to, the, to, the, to their daughters. And um, I think we need to continue the conversation in the hopes that we can educate even the adults better mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, helping them understand that all of us can contribute to science, whether you're a male or a female or other genders. And, um, and I, I really would like to encourage everyone to, you know, look, look beyond the gender. Mm -hmm. And just just look at the person and what the person can contribute to the field. Mm -hmm. At least my my take on it is that as a, yeah same thing. It's about the culture. I mean we 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 basically got used even as background noise, uh, hearing or witnessing uh, uh, female students, girls, uh, as early as preschool or even in, in, in the early elementary grade school years, saying, oh, you're pretty, oh, you're you're cute, etc." But never really that, man, you're sharp. Like, you're very clever at that. Uh, it's always about the physicality that, that's, that's always been praised for, for, for girls, but never the mental sharpness, never the, the, the cleverness. Usually, it becomes like second tier. Uh, she's sharp because there's really nothing much in the in the looks department, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, we laugh because we know that we've seen variations of that. That's not true. Not in this room. Not in this room. <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> but uh, I, it, it, it's not going to be an overnight change. It it has. Uh, it's going to be an overhaul of the whole 
uh, cultural tendency of downplaying uh, the mental sharpness of, uh, of, of girls and just lauding their, putting on the pedestal their, 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 their looks. Uh, I, I guess I, I would say in my in my own personal experience, it's it, it's definitely not the normal sort because okay, that's why I'm here right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we just hope that um, this overhaul continues. It's it's definitely an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. uh, we can actually laud both the physical looks and the mental acuity, the mental sharpness of of these children, regardless of sex and gender. And that is actually the most important thing. They have to be equal. You can be cute and very smart at the same time. Regardless of your, yeah, go on. Yeah, may I add? Uh, when I was a young, young teacher, after my uh, graduation from college, I taught in an all-girls school. And um, they belonged to a particular culture uh, here in the Philippines and, and I remember conversing with my high school students and I would say so am I gonna see you in college pursuing your math uh, degree and they say oh no 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 miss no we're expected to be married after college with children you know, there, there was that expectation and mm -hmm. um, and I said, seriously? You know, I, I'd get into that conversation with them. And they said, oh yes, oh yes, miss. It's our brothers who are expected to thrive in the sciences and math. Come here, we're just going to be housewives. We'll get... <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, oh wow. <laughs> and even until now, I mean, at my, my daughter is now seven, uh, seven years old. Um, She's in grade two now. Uh, in 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 her class, it's so it's so popular to be like, I want to be like Jenny from Blackpink, or one of the Sparkle Entertainment stars. And then I and then here comes my daughter saying, I want to be a marine biologist. That's her face right now. And they're like, what? <laughs> and they kind of they're not kind of they tease her or put put her down. Uh, uh, for for expressing that and even it's not just at the grown-ups even among peers among 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 her age there's already already that level of smart shaming which is kind of part of our culture as well it needs to be overhauled little by little right yeah. and um and you know when we have um smart women particularly it's often you know cause for prejudice to a certain extent you know she's She's too, uh, she's too smart. She's too cunning, you know, and it's seen in a very negative light. Rather than to really acknowledge um, how brilliant they are and what, and you know, the lengths they could contribute, you know, to the community and to society with their knowledge of the sciences. And this is the last question for this discussion. And after this, we'll open the floor to the students. And I hope you have your questions ready. Um, oh no, they have these. Don't worry, don't worry. Our panelists will not buy. <laughs> um, you can ask um, our panelists questions that you're curious about. But throughout, throughout the play, we've seen Madame Marie and Mrs. Ayrton recognize and celebrate their per personal and professional successes with a glass of wine or whiskey. These days, we have organizations such as Towns acknowledge the contributions of women scientists. And of course, you also have the government um, acknowledging um, women scientists. No? But quite interestingly, out of the 43 national scientists that we have in the Philippines, only 11 are women. So, so much has changed since the time of Madame Marie and Mrs. Ayrton, but there is still definitely so much to do. And I think maybe our last um, nugget no, to the students, what do you think are ways that students can contribute to you know, uplifting the achievements of women in the sciences? No? One is you know, cultural, not through sh smart shaming. Any others that you would like to um, add to that? Um, perhaps Lauren, would you like to add like, a way to celebrate um, oh. women in the sciences? Yeah, I mean, it's 
Kind of going to what the play is, uh, um, besides trying to be just a great piece of theater, it is the sort of see it, be it of it. I'm having more and more stories told that um, make heroes out of women in all professions, but certainly the ones that they've been excluded and uh, um, that there's an assumption that they are not built for, um, but of course they are. <laughs> so also I think doing, telling these stories not just of the struggle, but of the joy, and of the partnership and friendship. And one thing that I tend to do again and again, which I'm most proud of, is it's never a story of one woman. It's always, in this case, two. <laughs> but the whole play is two people, so the whole play is about women in science. Um, but other plays of mine, they're also about scientists, um, some of which Missy and Case have done. Um, are, uh, are about many women in various different personalities. And so the idea that there isn't one archetype um, for this, because certainly any scientist will tell you that it's never one person who does the thing. <laughs> right? It's always a, a collaboration, much like theater. Um, you, can't, you can't really do anything by yourself. Um, thank goodness, because that would be a boring world. But yes. Talk a week, guys. These are the Miss Universe questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I have a friend who said, you women celebrate yourselves a lot more and too much. And, and he's a male. And, <laughs> and he said that we don't do that. And so he feels that we are overdoing the celebration. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel <laughs> that um, they really have a different way of thinking. And so my point is, we celebrate everyone's achievements, whether you're male or female, woman, man, uh, or other gender. And But I think what has worked for us, at least in my family, when I, um, where I belong, and then the family that I had with uh, Darwin, I think make science, math, a natural thing as part of life of your children, whether they are sons or daughters. I didn't realize how natural math was to us in the family until somebody said, ooh, your family, it's untouchable because all of you can talk math and we can't relate. Um, but math is just so natural in our family. So with my daughters, you know, and, and even science, they both went to Philippine Science High School, so they also, you know, they, they could talk science. <laughs> and, and, and so I think treat things natural, you know, with, without really paying too much attention so that it becomes too special and then suddenly people realize that there are a lot of biases and, and, and prejudices. I guess along this, uh, along similar lines, uh, I would say knowledge is generally ungendered, not gendered at all. And uh, a lot of the, uh, in case it does, uh, some aspects of it appear to be so, we try as much as possible to say, hey, this is, um, uh, it's not simply a woman only knowledge because there is actually a basis, a logic for it that is not gendered whatsoever. They're, they're, they're all math. <laughs> but but uh, at least in our household, the immediate household that I have, we're, it, it's really funny because it's theology, <laughs> it's faith and reason. So it's a very dynamic uh, combination. So he talks about God, I talk about science. And it makes for an interesting dinner table talk because it's not because I'm I'm, I'm I'm a heretic or whatsoever, but I bring in at least a different uh, mode of thinking. But at least it's uh, there. The lines and the thought processes are open enough for both sides that we have that exchange. It's not it's it's freewheeling. It's no holds barred. It's not like uh, yeah, and you don't have to listen to this because it's only for men. It's only for women. No, everyone should know this. Look, I think you're better off knowing about this better than our students. <laughs> that sort of uh, that sort of discussion. They should be um, raising these new generations of children. They should be exposed to to this knowledge that this is definitely not gendered at all. So they're they're actually free to make choices, 
free to make uh, to actually contribute to this to this wellspring of uh, of humanity. Thank you so much. And I think on that note, it's knowledge, learning, the sciences knows no gender, right? It's accessible to everyone, and we should embrace it and we should welcome rather than. Uh, smart shape, you know, anyone who's venturing into the maths and the sciences. Now, I'd like to open the floor to our audience. Does anyone have any question to Lauren, to Doc Ui, to Doc Kathy? As long as these are questions that do not involve your upcoming exam or quiz, we'll entertain it. Although if it's a, if it's not their classes, maybe they'll have offered tips, but does anyone have any question? Yes. Please go to the microphone. Hello, I have a question for Miss Laura. Uh, I would like to ask, how was the writing process for the characters like while trying to flesh out historical figures in science? What sources or inspirations did you use in order to flesh out the characters and make them more relatable to everyone who would watch the play? Thank you. Oh wait, sorry. Could you repeat the question? Somebody who's in the room, I just want to make sure I got it. Uh, what? How was the process for writing the characters like? What artistic decisions? Oh, sorry. How? What, what sources or inspirations influenced your artistic decisions to be able to flesh out historical characters and make them more relatable to the present day people? Yeah, I think this one's for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, there is a, um, a, a lot of source material about Marie Curie. There's not a ton about Hertha. There is one book that her friend wrote um, that I had to purchase like the last copy printed 100 years ago. <laughs> um, but I did get to read it um, and still have it uh, somewhere back there. Um, but a lot of it was for writing theater in particular, as opposed to writing um, nonfiction or even a certain kind of novel, it is about making sure that the characters feel lived in. So even though there are certain things about Marie Curie and Herta that um, uh, I wanted to honor in terms of their history and biography, it's more important for them to feel real. And so you know, various language that may not have been perfectly accurate for that moment in 1906. Um, it's more important to feel uh, their passion and their bravery and their grit. Uh, so a lot of it is a combination of blending what m honors the, the, who they were and the time that they lived in, but also brings it up to this moment. We're watching this play now and it needs to feel emotionally relevant and resonant now. So that's always the, the blend. Um, but you know, there are still recordings of Marie Curie speaking um, that you can find. Uh, there are letters from Hertha, and um, of course, there are scientific papers, which are less dramatic, <laughs> um, but but nonetheless deeply interesting and gives me the great um, kind of giddy feeling uh, that I get when I get to write about history and then see some piece of it. So. Um, yeah, but it's 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 a it's a quite a big undertaking to write about somebody this iconic. So I I do try to to take it very seriously, but then also sort of apologize to their ghosts and say, yeah, I may have, may have, may have made some stuff up, <laughs> but I think it made your life more even more interesting. <laughs> thank you, All right, thank you. Um, the floor is also open for our panelists. If you have any questions to each other, like if Lauren would like to ask questions to scientists or if. Kathy. Oh, Kathy. Kathy has a question. Lauren, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> what were you referring to when you said Half Life uh, of Marie Curie? Because Half Life, of course, uh, it's a scientific concept. Um, it refers to the number of years the radioactivity hits its uh, halfway point. So, so were you were you referring to that? Such a beautiful turn of phrase, uh, and one that I couldn't. Um, uh, uh, I, I tried not to title it that, but it was so beautiful and perfect. 
So I think the metaphor, the scientific metaphor, is not inaccurate for where we find Marie when we first meet her. She is at a point when she has been, for the large majority of her adult life, um, a scientist of great um, repute and uh, a beloved national figure and some, you know, version of the perfect, brilliant woman, mother of two, happily married, you know, uh, widowed, but still, you know, um, uh, honoring her husband. And then that changes very quickly. So she becomes a new, the half-life tipping point of more other than self becomes when she is now this scandal-ridden um, woman betraying her husband and her country and her gender and everything, right? So she has become the other. Um, and But then just the idea of that just the phrase half-life just felt like a little tiny poem that kind of, I, I, know, I know the metaphor of it, but also I don't know, I mean, what, what does it mean to anyone watching it? It's like everyone is can interpret it in their own sort of way, so. Thank you for the question. That's delightfully nerdy, and I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, well, you're welcome to share, Missy. Yes, I really, 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 super duper love the play, um, and I, uh, I, when we talked with, with Lauren, Kaisa, and I during uh, one reading when we were still analyzing the text, I asked her if half life, because um, it means so many things as a metaphor. It's layers and layers and layers of meaning. And, and so, of course, one is the journey that uh, Marie was going through as she shed herself and the many things that society was imposing on her, and also how she was becoming less, but also more of who she is. But also, I think it's Hertha. Hertha is her other half, so to speak, someone who was able to give her back who she was. So, so there's that literal function, but there's also that metaphorical function, which just keeps on giving and giving and just keeps on opening up every time you do the show. So thank you, Lauren, for that. And in ways, that's how, well, this might be scientifically true, but I mean, to a certain extent, that's how so much of the play radiates that friendship, radiates the characters, radiates their growth, their knowledge, and their science. And it's, um, and it's and it's beautiful in that manner. We have a wonderful student who has another question. Please uh, share with us on stage. Uh, hi, uh, this question is open for all of you because I want to see your different perspectives on it. Um, just for context, I wanted to be in a STEM course or go through a life of STEM. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not good at STEM, <laughs> specifically math. So I kind of dropped that dream, and instead I went through my other dream, which is uh, theater. Um, I wanted to know if through art, could you still live a life that is filled with STEM, or filled with the concepts of STEM, and then vice versa for you too. Uh, through STEM, can you have, live a life that has the aspects and elements of art? Right. What a, another Miss Universe question, who would like to answer first? Um, Perhaps we'll start with, would you like to start, Kathy, or? Lauren. Or would Lauren, would you like to? Yeah. You can, Lauren gave the go signal, maybe. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, this is gonna be strange, because um, I've always believed that when you say, that, that, that people should, shouldn't say that they can't do STEM. Uh, you have that ability. You just need to dig it out. So that said, um, as a mathematician, well, I sucked in arts. I remember that um, I would get my mom to do my art projects <laughs> in school. But in high school, I got interested in theater, let me see. Wow. <laughs> and in fact, I joined the PETA workshop in our school. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no problem. There's a room for you, Kathy. Yeah. Now that you <laughs> should with us. And interestingly, um, my daughters, they have a very good combination of math and art, science and art. It's always there. You just have to, maybe you need somebody who can nurture both. No. But they work well together. Like my daughter, who's a science communicator, she uses her art prowess to design the books that they are producing in their laboratory. 
my second daughter uh, was actually in Blue Repertory. <laughs> so, so, so it it can happen. It can happen. So I hope to see you in a STEM course later. <laughs> you can think of it as there are two sides of the same coin called life. They are art. Um, is just one way or one mode of thinking and STEM is just another um, another set or another rules on, on how you think and approach the world. So there's it's you you there's no contrast, there's no how to say this conflict between the two of them. You could actually you just as 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 Doc Kathy said, you just it's it's well within any one of us. We were all kind of geared for that we just need to bring that out and sometimes consciously but at other times it's actually a very unconscious thing so um the expression of art in stem is about it's 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 actually natural I, i'm not a great artist myself but remember um, as i've mentioned before i started in this field from literature so it's by reading all these uh all, all these books about these stories about these brilliant characters and then from that feeling of wanting to write about these characters to actually act or be one like them like a scientist that you know that the, the line between art and stem is suddenly blurry you, you just don't see yourself as just a pure scientist you're you're basically living life and the funny thing is that, yeah, sorry, Missy, but my daughter say it is it has the makings of a theater kid. Oh no! me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lauren, you know, I think of myself as a engineering-minded artist. So <laughs> my process for writing is based largely in um, uh, a theatrical conversation around dramatic structure. And I take that word very seriously. It is uh, structural. I'm looking at architecture, engineering. Story is not accidental. Every scene is efficient and needs to accomplish what it's doing as a, a, a brick in a wall. Um, it is something that has to stand up and has to do its job and, like a roller coaster. You have to build it to hit these points. and. Um, curves in the exact way. So uh, I've always thought of my, or I should say when I, when I started to think of myself in terms outside of just the pure creative muse inspired um, poet wandering in the woods um, and something that is intentional and craft based and artisanal. Um, I like to talk about the word playwright. The right part of it actually does not mean what you do with a pen. Of course, it's an old English word for a builder, a maker, a creator. Um, so we are play crafters. We are create builders, not play, you know, scribblers. <laughs> um, and so the more I think about that, it helps me find a um, a more technical side to um, what is often seen as a kind of. Um, uh, you know, a accidental inspiration-based uh, form, but it's not, it's intentional. So kind of treating the arts with the respect, um, the technical respect that we give the sciences is also a way to kind of exchange the value of both of them um, and amplify the value of both of them. So it's not just writing about science. I sort of like to write as a scientist in some way. I even teach, when I teach playwriting, I often use the scientific method as an example of how play structure actually works. We are starting with a hypothesis. We're gonna prove it and fail a dozen times. That main character is gonna keep iterating um, on it. And then at the end, we're gonna see um, if they get get what they wanted, if the, if the truth is there and what it means. Um, and I think that actually teaches playwriting and storytelling actually more accurately than it is often taught um, to to playwrights without that metaphor. So there's a lot of sharing and mind mind bl bending and blending uh, that we can do across uh, across discipline. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yes. yes. Um, by the way, my math major daughter uh, took a second degree, which was BFA in information design. So it's really a very good combination for her. Right. So I think there are also like 
test I've, I've heard this from uh, Dean uh, she did tessellations and uh, before there were tessellations as well and then uh, math and art and um, I remember Dr. De Las Peñas uh, I went to a uh, I went to the Dreamweavers in um, Mindanao and she asked me, do you have pictures of the fabric, um, like this fabric um, that Missy's wearing in terms of Iwatani, the patterns can be mathematically solved. And so, yeah, so, you know, there's, there's, there's room for, for the sciences and the art to come together. And I think this play and of course our wonderful speakers are, Testaments, you know, to how math and the, oh, sorry, how the sciences, right, and art could come together. So, on that note, let's give our speakers, our audience, um, a round of applause for this wonderful afternoon. Um, unfortunately, Lauren will give you a virtual certificate of love, care of Missy. So, uh, there's tokens from us. Um, and, but here we'd like to. We'll send it to the U.S. Well, Missy promised she'll send it to the U.S. But we'd like to give a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Wee and to Dr. Kathy for their um, participation in today's talk. It's a joy. As um, as oh, let's have some picture together. wonderful lecture may hopefully this encourage you encourage you to look into the sciences and into the art and you know find your own half lives as you continue your your I guess um, learning journey here in Ateneo and of course in your life so the play is still ongoing you can catch it this Friday and this Saturday today to Saturday today to Saturday we're sold out but we have additional seats Friday afternoon, 3 p.m. and Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Thank you. There you go. So if you have time, please watch the play. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Oh,